In the last episode, we covered Proclamation 1 of the Win Without Pitching Manifesto by Blair Enns. In this episode, we are going to be talking about Proclamation Number 2, which is all about replacing presentations with conversations. And we're going to talk about the power of a good conversation today. But first, if you are a solopreneur who is into branding in the creative industry and want to amplify your skills, mindset, and remote work lifestyle, then smack that subscribe button, hit the notification bell so you don't miss out, and give us a like if you enjoyed the show. This is Brand or Die, and I am your host, Steve Reed. Let's do this. Okay, so let's get something out of the way right off the bat. This this used to be called the Remote Creative Podcast because that's how it originally started out. It was an audio-based podcast. And then I decided to switch everything to video. Now, back early, early on when I created Remote Creative, which still exists, that's my network where I teach people my framework on how to start their own branding agencies. That was originally more broad in subject matter. It covered the entire creative industry as a whole. It was focused a lot on a foundation of offering websites and building out from there. But it went through a series of pivots as I began to understand my audience more and their needs. And so I shifted everything over to branding And that was probably the smartest thing I could have done because it really lays the foundation of everything necessary for an organization to connect to a target audience and influence every single interaction along the way through a defined strategy and the specific skills and techniques and observations that are going to allow those interactions to be as amazing as possible so that the audiences are getting what they want and the organizations are getting what they want and it's win, win, win all the way around. That's what we're looking for. So I decided uh, just, I've been wanting to change the name of the show for a long time. So it's no longer a podcast, it's a show because we have video, we have guests, there are gonna be more guests, we have Uh, visual things that we're going to be looking at now. So it it goes far beyond just audio. And so I wanted to go with Brand or Die too, because that's been the slogan for my own company, Vector, uh, where I offer branding services. And I've loved the slogan Brand or Die. Just a little bit of background. I have a great, 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 I can't remember how many greats, grandfather who was in uh, the Revolutionary War. And he was actually... Uh, one of those son of a guns that was in the Boston Tea Party dumping the British tea into the harbor. Yeah, and uh, he was a little bit of a rebel, but Joseph Reed, my ancestor, he and five of his sons fought in the Revolutionary War. And I've always been inspired by their story and what they sacrificed so that me and so many other people can have the opportunity to live in this country. Now, obviously it's got its share of flaws and everything, but I love this country. I love what it's given to my family and I love all the good things about this country. The good things about this country are so amazing and so great that in my mind, they outweigh all of the bad. We'll overcome the bad because of the good that's here. And I think it's important to remember that. And so in looking for some inspiration on how I could emphasize the importance of branding, you know, I was going back to these old Revolutionary War uh, flags. And I'm from Texas, and so we have, we've got the, the flag with the cannon on it that says, come and take it. There's some history behind that. Come and get them! But there's so many great flags from that time. And uh, they had so much attitude and grit. And I just, I absolutely love it. And I I remembered the join or die flag that has the snake on it that's all chopped up. And it's basically telling these colonies, hey, you're either going to join or you're going to die. It was an ultimatum. 
It was black and white. It was two different choices about your future and destiny. And so immediately in my mind, I said, brand or die. That's where I got the idea from. And I said, is that too harsh? And I thought about it from a couple of different angles. And I said, no, it's not too harsh because it, I feel like it's accurate. And I feel like it's true for uh, many, many organizations uh, one way or another. And when you look at the broader landscape of what I'm trying to do, not only do I have my own uh, branding agency where I am trying to help businesses either brand or die, I'm also coaching people who are getting started in the creative industry. And that's my message to them as well. Be involved in branding. It's a lot of these guys, they're just doing logos. They're just doing websites. They're just doing social media. They're doing all of these, these, I, I would say low end components of a much bigger picture. And without the, the foundation of a brand strategy, they're going to continue to struggle as commodities at the bottom of the barrel, not really fully achieving their best. And they're going to shrivel up and die as companies. And I've talked to many, many people, many other uh, of my colleagues out there who are still stuck just doing this menial work. And that's my message to them as well. It's brand or die. It's time to step up. It's time to go to the next level. And so that's why I created a course to basically put my solopreneur branding agency framework into their hands. I'm very passionate about it. And so for that reason and several others, I think I decided to shift the name of this, what started out as a podcast to a show called Brand or Die, because I want to emphasize, I think it's stickier in the mind. It uh, It's easy to remember. It's powerful. And so that's what I'm going to go with. I debated about it for a long time because I'm already 20 something episodes in and to shift the name at this point, I, I want to be thousands of episodes in. So better to do it in the early 20s than in the hundreds or the thousands. So you know what? I'm just going to rip off the Band-Aid and I'm going to do it and whatever. So this is a big pivot for the show. Remote Creative still exists. You can still go to remotecreative.io. Uh, my company, Vector.com, that is still there. I am spread across a couple of different areas. And I do this show because I enjoy it. It allows me to share some of my expertise with both my clients and also hopefully inspire other people out there to pivot to a branding agency and get the tools that they need to do a better job. Because ultimately at the, the end of the day, the reason for all of this is to help every organization, every business, every movement out there to achieve its dreams and to connect with their audiences. Because it affects people at the end of the day. It affects our society. It affects the connections we have between others. And that's very important. And that's the ultimate vision is to make those connections deeper, richer, and just overall better and improve society by helping everyone involved. And I love the fact that so much about this creates those multiple wins. So anyway, I just want to throw that out there. I'm not going to go back into that again. That's the full explanation. There's probably not much more than that, but we're going to go ahead and dig into this episode now, and we're going to talk about the power of conversation. And so what uh, Blair says here right at the beginning of this proclamation is he says that presentation like pitch is a word that we will leave behind as we seek conversation and collaboration in their place. Now, if you're unfamiliar with this aspect of the creative industry, oftentimes a large business or an organization, they will want various agencies to come and pitch them their ideas. So what that means is you may have a tendency of putting a lot of work together for free to give to these businesses and try to compete with others to win that job. Now, what happens if you don't get the job? Well, then you did a bunch of work essentially for free. And you may say, well, that's the price to pay for getting big jobs. And there's an argument to be made for that. But there's also another argument to be made. And this is Blair's argument. And I tend to strongly agree with his argument because there are some, I think, major flaws of that other uh, strategy. 
So he says next, we love presenting so much that we're willing to do it for free. This is the dirty little secret of our profession. We like to do it for free because we're creative people. We love the process of going in and wowing people and, and doing the creative work. We love doing the creative work so much. And that is really our Achilles heel in a sense. And what he calls the dirty little secret of our profession, because that's where we get taken advantage of. And whether these, these clients of ours know that or not, that's just how it works out. Okay. Well, keep explaining this and get into it. So he says, we must move away from the place where the client sits with arms crossed in the role of judge. And we take to the stage with song and dance in the role of auditioning talent. And that right there is the problem. We basically make ourselves dancing monkeys. And it's up to us to convince them to go with us. And what he proposes in his book is a dramatic shift away from that forever because it changes the, the power dynamic in the relationship. In, in this particular dynamic where the client is sitting there as the judge and we're the dancing monkey, they have all the power in the situation. And if we're in that situation, it's because we didn't do a good job with the first proclamation, which is we will specialize. We have not positioned ourselves correctly as an expert and the only viable option. We're looked at as one of many other options out there. And if that's the case, we have not done a good job at articulating our expertise enough to where that client is going, okay, this is the one and only agency that's for us. Come hell or high water, these are the guys. And is that an easy thing to do? Well, I don't know that it's a matter of being easy or hard. It's a matter of following the steps that lead you to that end. And it's, it's hard. It's much harder to be undifferentiated and confused with so many other businesses to try to then come into a situation and land a client, especially at the prices you're wanting to charge because of the value that you're bringing to the table. And so it's constantly a job of articulating your claims to expertise and building on those things continually by what you put out there into the world. And so that's the key. So we're going to move away from this, the song and dance, and we are going to establish ourselves as different than everybody else for the particular clients that we're going to be working with, our niche. We are going to work for a specific group of of people that have a specific mission that do a specific thing for a specific audience. And we are going to become experts in that arena. And we're going to dominate in that particular niche. And what that does is it opens up other creative agencies to do the same. They can go dominate in, in another one of thousands and thousands of thousands of other industries and niches within those industries. There's literally so much opportunity out there. There's so many people with so many different interests uh, that there, there's just unlimited really opportunity out there. It's, it's really amazing when you dig into it. So we're going to dig into the five rules of collaboration, as he calls them. And let's start with number one, strategy first. What does that mean? Well, he says, we will agree with the client on the strategy before any creative work begins. Now I've fallen into this trap many, many times before, and it's, it's so tempting to provide some type of creative work, whether that creative work is uh, conceptual or whether it's a wireframe or sketches of some kind of imagining what the end result will be. Cause that's what creative people like to do. We're very imaginative. We like to picture the end result and we like to show off our skills and our talents to people, but that has to stop. We have to agree on a strategy first in a brand strategy. That's where I begin with my clients. 
the brand strategy is the mind, the personality, and the voice of the brand and many other things, but primarily I would say like those three things, generally speaking. In the early 2000s, when I was building websites, I was working with a group that was taking on clients and those clients wanted websites. And this is literally how things were done. The client would come in, they'd get it and they're okay, they need a website. And I'd say, okay, do we have some content? Do we have something? And they go, no, just design the website. They wanna see what it'll look like. And then they'll give you the content. And I was like, okay. So I would just design a website knowing very little about the company, who their audience was. I would just design something that looked cool because I was a designer. And that's how a designer is an artist. And that's how artists think. Artists just make cool looking things that they like and that they think will cool and that, that are cool and that and then what other people will think are wonderful and great. And that can, uh, that can carry you to a certain degree. Every now and then you get lucky. You design something that people really like and whatnot. But doing anything in business just purely based on luck is foolish. And so here's what would happen. I would design it and, and time after time again, they would see it and they would say, well, that's great, but it's missing this and this and this. We wanted a testimonial up here. We wanted a video there. We wanted a, a button over here and we like things more on the left than the right. And I would just sit there internally and I would, I would just die inside each and every time. And I'm like, why didn't we get this from them in the beginning? <laughs> why did, why are we doing things backwards? Why don't we agree to a strategy first? And so that's when a good friend, a developer named Joe, and Joe, if you happen to be listening, uh, thank you. You changed my life. <laughs> but he gave me a copy of this book, or I, don't, I think I bought the book, but he told me about it. It was called The Elements of User Experience. And that book just blew me away because it was a framework for building websites, starting with the core strategy, the structure. And, and you basically move from a strategic level to then the design of the website, which is actually the last thing that you consider. But we were doing it backwards. We were designing a site and then destroying everything as we tried to cram some kind of strategy into it. And I think I, I called it Frankensteining at the time. Fire <laughs> It was a horrible process that delivered substandard, terrible results. And so then all throughout those years, you heard the phrase content is king just being thrown around everywhere. Everyone was saying content is king, content is king. And that was very helpful because we would say, you know, content is king. We need content. And, uh, but it's not just content. There's the strategy that exists before you even write any of the content. And so we skipped out on that for a long, 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 long time. And uh, so as years have gone by, there's been more research done. There's been more projects built. There's been things that have been tested. There's new ideas that have come out. People have pioneered different things. And so now it's a much more comprehensive approach. And uh, that approach has gone, just busted through the, the walls of the website realm into the overall business strategy on a macro level. And so this is the important thing. We have to plan what our strategy is going to be. And a strategy is gonna outline everything. And so in the brand strategies that I create, I discuss with the stakeholders in the business, we go through everything. We go through who their competition is, what cure they have for an audience's pain, how they cure that pain. We niche down that audience into a very specific subset of individuals that feel that pain the most and experience it more deeply, and then we decide amongst those individuals which audience is going to be the most profitable to go after. Who can we best help and who is going to generate the most profit and support the business? We use those types of strategies and techniques to then put a target over that audience. And then we go in and we interview people that are inside of that target audience because we wanna get data from them. We wanna to talk to them about their journey, what triggers them to act, what types of decision-making they use, 
who else is affected by their decisions and several series of questions that we go through to weed out where their mindset is and see how well that connects with our predictions of who we're going after and what other information we can get. And then from these two groups, we weave them together and we position the business to directly connect with that audience by creating a a brand personality archetype for the business. There are 12 archetypes and I will often synthesize at least two of these archetypes if it helps us connect better with that business. So the secondary archetype, sometimes there's a tie between several of them, but we can use that secondary archetype to shift the primary archetype slightly and give us something really unique, but a personality that the audience can connect with, with the business. And all of this strategic work and more happens before any of the creative work begins. So, because now the creative work is going to be informed by the strategy. You can keep coming back to it to find answers and guidance and make sure everything is consistent and is directly targeted at that audience. It's very, very important. So the second one, continuous reference to strategy. And this is what I was getting at there. And it says, keep the discussion around the creative focused and measured against the strategy. So yeah, we already talked about that a little bit. I got a little bit ahead of myself there, but that's exactly right. It helps us to keep all of the discussions that happen from that time forward focused and measured against that strategy. And that is something that I experience almost on a daily basis when talking to my clients and going through the various work that we're doing. Whenever there's a question, whenever the client says, well, why don't we just change this color? or why don't we do X, Y, and Z, or whatever. Sometimes, well, I would say frequently when you don't have a strategy in place, you don't have an answer to that as a creative. You, it basically comes down to the authority of, of the client to just say, I don't like that color, change it. And what do you have to say against that? You can't say anything. It's, there, there's nothing quantifiable to rest back upon. But if you have a strategy in place, we go back to the strategy and say, what does the strategy prescribe? What did we already figure out? Why did we choose the colors we went with? And then that helps to clarify. It's going back to the foundations and having that foundation is absolutely critical. Three, freedom of execution. So this one is key as well. So Blair says the client must ultimately approve of our recommendations and be satisfied with the outcome, but he must also let us explore along the way. So yeah, the client is ultimately going to be satisfied and happy. And I always like to preface any type of work I begin with a client and we get into this process to say, look, it's very common for us to discover things along the way that we did not foresee the ultimate realization of the brand may not be what you think it is. You may have an idea in your mind of what the end result should look like. And that may or may not be correct. We have to validate those assumptions because I may have assumptions too that are wildly different from yours. And the end result might be different from both of our assumptions. So it's always a good idea yeah, you want to have a general concept in mind, but when we're dealing with data, when we're dealing with the validation of assumptions, we have to be willing to let the process happen. And we have to be allowed as a branding agency and creatives to explore along the way, to discover and to find those hidden pieces of the puzzle that other people are not seeing because they did not go through the same process. We're going on a journey and we may find things that we didn't expect. And if the data says that this is the way to go, we need to have the courage and the vision to take that path. Number four, fewer options of better quality. I love this one. So 
he says, it's an abdication of our responsibility and our expert position in the relationship to share all of our endeavors with the client and then ask him to choose. There are a couple of small exceptions to this, I would say, but primarily, let me, let me give you an example. Way back in the day, when I first started doing logos, I was involving the client in the process every step along the way because I wanted to be transparent. I wanted to involve the client because they wanted to be involved. And so with logos, for instance, I would show them some sketches. So I'd start in my sketchbook and I'd do thumbnails of logos. And it's okay, here are some ideas I have. Which way do you, should we go? It's a, ooh, I really like that one. Let's do that one. I'd be like, crap. Oh, crap. That's the one I hated the most. <laughs> but I wanted to show them a bunch of different logos so they could see how creative I was, right? I can make all of these different logos. Wow, this guy is a really good designer. And so they would choose one and I'd say, okay, then I would, I'd create just solid black and white versions of the logo, something cleaned up in vector format. And they'd say, ooh, oh, these look good. Um, I, I have these variations here. I want that variation. I'd be like, man, they should have chose this one because if they only saw what was in my mind, the full color version, they'd realize how much more versatile this was. But see, I didn't give them that option. Of, of course, they're going to choose something else because they're seeing something different in their mind. Each step along that way, they, they as a non-designer are seeing something completely different than what I'm seeing. Because when I'm designing even those little sketches, I'm seeing a final result in my head. I'm seeing something, maybe many different varieties and options but I'm giving them the ability to choose, which is a huge mistake. And we'll explain why if you haven't already figured this out. Then we'd get into the colors and I would say, here are all your different color variations. Oh, God. See this, <laughs> there was no brand strategy in place that went through the process of learning about the target audience, learning about the competition, exploring the psychology of color and everything. It was just a gut reaction to color. Then they would pick the colors and then it was the final version and then tweak, 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 tweak. And then they get their final logo and the client was really happy with it. But I've seen this over and over again and I've talked about this before on past episodes, but just because you design a logo doesn't mean it's the right logo. And I've seen far too many people using the wrong logo. And, and not because it's a bad design, but because the audience doesn't connect with it. It's the wrong logo. It's a beautiful logo. It's just not for that audience. And now how critical is a logo to a business? Well, I think that's one of those things where it depends. Some businesses, the logo is not as critical, especially if you are a kind of a solo independent individual, like a, I would say like an insurance agent and you have your own company and you're dealing with clients on a one-to-one -one basis and they know you by name. In that case, your logo is less important because you're the logo, you're the face, you're the everything, right? But if you're a business with multiple people and you're far removed from the actual clients, then I think the logo becomes more important as the business grows and is larger. And so that's something to take into consideration. But at the end of the day, I would involve the client in the process and I was abdicating my expertise to somebody without the expertise. And I think you can see where that problem lies. So I changed my process and I said, you know what? The client does not get to see the sausage being made. There's no reason for them to. And there's actually a better reason for doing this. So my process now involves me going through the entire design process, building the ideal logo based off a strategy. I don't do any of this work anymore for clients without a brand strategy. No exceptions. Either we have a brand strategy in place, either they already have one or I do it, but I don't do any creative work without a strategy in place. I just don't anymore because I don't think it's in the best interest of the client and their audience. I don't think I can get them the quality. I'm just guessing. I'm playing pin the tail on the donkey. 
if they want to do that to their own business, fine, but I'm, I'm not going to help them tank their business or negatively affect what they're doing. And then my name, my work is on that. I can't do that. They don't get to see the sausage being made. I produce the logo and they get to see, and this goes a little bit slightly against what this particular proclamation is saying, replacing presentations with conversations. But the difference here is I've already landed the client. They have already put down a deposit. They've already paid. We're in a relationship right now. And so what I'm hoping to do at this point in the way I present the logo to them is I'm presenting them with a finished copy of it. And so my process involves a little bit of a presentation. It is a little theatrical. We go through into the thinking, the strategic thinking that we began with. We put some pieces together, a little bit of a, a history and background about where we're going. And then boom, they get to see the full logo completely finished in color in a mock-up on something not floating on a white background out of context, in context. And we go to mock-up to mock-up to all the different ways that particular logo for that particular client, that particular target audience is going to be experienced so they can get an idea of what this looks like in the real world. Then we view it isolated, vertical combination, horizontal combination, the logo mark, the word mark, all those different things. We finish it off with just boom the logo sitting there. And that strategy has resulted in me getting my logos approved by the client 100% of the time. I have a record without any revisions. That's because when we did the work of coming up with a strategy and we went through that process and then we see the logo, we all know it's the right logo. There's no question because we understand what our strategy is, the audience we're trying to connect with, and all those other factors involved. And so when you take people through that and explain it to them, and I want them to see the logo for the first time as their clients would see it. I want them to have a visceral gut reaction. And you don't get that if you're involving them in the design process from the beginning with the sketches and everything like that, because you are giving them bias right from the beginning. And when I want them to see that logo, I want them to see it without any bias at all. They're going to have a visceral gut reaction. I want to see their faces when they behold it for the first time. And that type of experience to me is incredibly valuable. This is what I compare it to. I said, imagine if the groom has already decided he wants to marry the bride in a wedding. Imagine if the groom was allowed to go in to where the bride was getting all dolled up for the big day. And he is sitting there with his arms folded as the judge and decision maker and the hairstylist, the makeup person, they are all getting instructions from the groom. And the groom is saying, no, no, no. Could you, could you fix that eyeshadow? Can we do that a little bit different? No, no, no. Start over again. Let's go and do this. See, they, they already have an idea. They know what they're doing. She's going to be beautiful. The bride's going to be beautiful, right? It's not going to help to have the guy going in there who's never done makeup a day in his life, who doesn't know how to do hair, who doesn't know how to... Why would you involve... Why would you bring him in there and let his decisions have any influence? Everybody wants that moment where they're all going to be looking at the groom. The groom's standing up there in his tuxedo, waiting for the bride to come out. She comes out. She's really the star of the show, right? She comes out and everyone looks at the bride and they go, oh, she's so beautiful. And then they look at the groom and he's just like, you know, he's got this look on his face. He starts crying. And that's the moment that everybody likes, right? And so, so in a, in a degree, that's kind of what I do with my clients. I want to see their faces when they see the logo for the first time. Did it connect? Now, it's more important that that logo connects with the, the target audience. And I do research on that before they even see the logo. We'll go back to those same people. Sometimes I'll Venmo them some money for participating in a little survey. But I'll show them a logo and I'll show it in a couple different variations and I'll ask them questions about it. And we'll see how well it connects with them if they get it. If it accomplishes the purpose of communicating who the business is and what they do. 
Now, a brand is much more than just a logo, of course, but that's just the process for the logo specifically. And so now when I present it to them, I'll show them st some statistics about the survey results, what the people said. We'll just distill a lot of that and we'll say, look, this tested very well with the target audience. This is the right direction to go. And, and then boom, we got it. We did it. So that is a much different experience from when I first started out asking the client their opinion on every single step of the process. Most of the time it delivered crap results and it put me in a position of actually not being an expert. Because if I'm deferring to them saying, hey, what do you, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? What do you want? What do you want? It's not that simple. What it's do you want? What do you want? Well, then who am I? If you went to a brain surgeon and the brain surgeon's like, well, there's four ways that we could do your brain surgery. Which one do you want to do? You wouldn't be, oh, let's do that one because it has a cool name. I mean, what? that procedure has a cool name. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You're not going to do that. You're the brain surgeon. Can you please tell me what you would recommend? If it was your brain, what would you do? And so if we want to be in the position of experts, we have to tell the client what the right decision is. And we have to base that off of the strategy that was produced. So that's a completely different scenario. And that's what it means by fewer options of better quality. We give them fewer options, but they're better quality options. And I, I talked about a couple different exceptions. So there are a couple exceptions. One of them is when I'm doing stylescapes, which is where we lay the foundation of the strategy for the brand identity, all the collateral and everything. So we'll build a stylescape. And typically what I'll do is I'll get three stylescapes designed. Sometimes for budgetary reasons that we'll just do one style scape, which is fine and make sure it's the right one. But I like doing three from three different artists and they design those off of the strategy. We can certainly test them with the target audience, throw them out, say, Hey, which do you prefer? If this was the brand and you were going to buy from this customer, this particular thing, which one of these resonates with you? And then we'll see what the audience decides. And at that point, we will make a recommendation to the business. I think there are many other things to consider when you're looking at an overall brand identity. And we explore those things. But that process involves a little bit more collaboration with the client. And it can vary from client to client depending on certain situations. All right, let's go to number five. Only we present our work. This is key. Our key client may assist us, but our work does not get presented without our involvement, which means you should never just simply send out some type of pitch deck or a logo design proposal or a brand strategy proposal, anything like that, and then just let other people read it, whether you're emailing it to them or you're sending it to this guy who sends it to somebody else and then they present it to the stakeholders. No, we present our work. We're the best people equipped to do it. We have to explain our thinking behind what was produced. And so we get to present it. That is so very important. And I do this typically through Zoom calls where we'll get together and we'll be talking just like this. I'll get to share my screen, explain all the thinking. I can see the reactions and we go from there. So I'm always, always involved in that process because I position myself as the expert and I'm going to take ownership of my work and present my work all the time. Blair says presenting is a tool of swaying while conversing is a tool of weighing. And really, there's a lot of truth to this. When you're presenting, you're pitching, basically. And you're trying to convince somebody of something. And the book is called The Win Without Pitching Manifesto. So how can you win if you're not presenting something? You do have to present some things at some times. Like the logo. I talked about my logo presentation. Is that a tool of swaying? You could say that in some degree, but... But that logo has come out of conversations. 
And those conversations have happened between the business, the target audience, discussions have already happened. Now it is a creative pursuit to turn those conversations into a result. And then you have to present that at some point and let them, and let them approve it. Because ultimately they, they have to approve everything. We can't just come in and force people to take our recommendations, but presenting overall, trying to get the job by presenting is, is more so a tool of swaying, like presenting yourself in that format where you're the dancing monkey and you're just, please hire me, please give me the job. That's a tool of swaying. Conversing is a tool of weighing. It means you're going to have a discussion with them. You're going to seek to understand them. And that's where your expertise is going to go show through by the questions that you're going to ask and the conversations that you're going to have. That's going to position you as an expert to where they know, okay, this is the person that we want to go with. All right. So continuing, he says, it's not our job to convince the client to hire us via presentation or any other means. Convincing has no place in selling. And for me, this was a really refreshing realization when I read this book because you see a lot of salespeople out there and a lot of people are talking about sales. Like you got to be hardcore. You got to convince. And there's tricks and tactics and all these different things to sell, sell, sell and get the job. And it works. You can use that methodology to drive sales, but in creative work, and I would argue this, this goes across many other industries as well. Perhaps it's not totally universal, but the way I like to deal with clients and with creative work and branding, I find that this is true. I don't try to convince any of my clients to go with me. I present what I do. We talk about them. We talk about their situation. I discuss my strategies and methodologies for getting them their ideal outcome. And it's up to them to decide. So I position everything I do with the client as an investment because my ultimate objective is to make them profitable and to make them far more money than they're going to spend with me. What they spend with me is a fraction of what I am working towards bringing to them through the work that I am providing. Blair says our mission is to position, our objective is to de determine a fit. So yeah, that's our ultimate mission is we want to position ourselves so that our audience knows who we are, what we do, and that we're the right people to work with for them. That's our mission. Our objective is to determine a fit. An objective of that mission is when we talk to the client, we need to make sure that we are the right fit for them. And that's something that I will tell clients often is I'll say, look, what we need to decide right now is if I'm the right fit for you and you're the right fit for me and that we are going to work well with each other. So I'm not the one on trial alone here. They are as a client. I need to see if I want to work with them. I'm not desperate for work. I pick and choose who I want to work with. And if I don't happen to like your business or if there's any reason why I don't feel like I'm the right person for this or if what their needs are, are outside of my wheelhouse. Maybe I don't have experience in that particular arena. I'm not going to fake any of that. And so there are many different things that can determine an incompatible fit. And so I'm not going to move forward with a client unless the fit is there. And so I make sure to tell them that it's not just a matter if I'm right for them. It's if they're right for me. So that's an important thing. Okay. The final quote we're going to read here out of this chapter, and we've only just touched on a small fragment of what is part of this proclamation. And I highly encourage a reading of this book, the audio book, the physical copy. They're absolutely fantastic, both of them. And I would, I'd recommend listening to it and reading it. It's only, like I said, it's only 138 pages. 
it takes two and a half hours to listen to. It's nothing. You can do that easily in a morning or an afternoon, not even a whole day. It's not even a day of work. It's like a morning or an afternoon of work, but it will have a significant impact on your life as a creative entrepreneur. I guarantee you. What he says here is in this manner, how we sell shapes what we sell. It impacts our likelihood of delivering a high quality outcome and it affects the remuneration we are able to command for our work. It affects our bottom line. Absolutely. And I mean, that just can't be emphasized enough is when you're in a creative industry like this, pricing creativity is a very challenging thing. And without an understanding or some type of framework, most creatives sell themselves short. Most of them do. I would say the vast, vast majority, which is great for businesses out there because they'll hire out that stuff for cheap. But the problem is in their desire to just get, simply get cheap work without an underlying strategy in place, they are unconsciously sabotaging themselves in many, many cases. And so there needs to be something else in this mix. And that is the strategy. And when the business has the strategy and the strategy informs the creative work, you get astronomically better results that are actually quantifiable that you can rest on and you know are correct. And so the business is not going to be just wasting time and money on having no strategy at all and then having to come back and rebrand and do all this extra work later. I mean, sometimes that's necessary if a business wants to pivot or a new opportunity arises that was not seen before. There's many different things that can happen in business. Most businesses, I think, will pivot about five times on average. That's not because they were making bad decisions. It's just simply because new opportunities opened up and you have to be agile enough to take advantage of those things if necessary. Anyway, there's a lot that goes into this, but it's a step-by-step -step process. You start at the beginning and you work your way down and you get the right results. And I have a framework and methodology for doing this with my clients. And I would highly recommend that if you are somebody that's a creative and all you're doing is selling the, the work itself, you're free to do that. That's fine. And you may be very successful at it. You may be happy with what you're doing, happy with what you're making. That's awesome. But if you're struggling and you want to deliver a higher quality result to your clients and you want to make a lot more doing it, then you may want to look at transitioning up into a creative agency. Check out remotecreative.io for some more information on that. If you are a business and you're interested in getting creative work done and hiring it out and hiring out the strategic work, I highly recommend you work with a, a branding agency that does this work. Now, there's a lot of agencies out there that are like marketing agencies and different people that say they do branding. But what you want to ask them specifically is say, tell me about your brand strategy process. Because there's a lot of people that say branding and what they mean is they do brand collateral, meaning they do logos and graphic design and webs. They're just graphic design companies. And that's what they call branding. That's a part of branding. That's actually part of brand identity. But the actual strategic branding process that involves positioning, voice, archetypes, all of those types of things, competitive analysis, there's, there should be a process in place to do that. And I would look for an agency that appeals specifically to your niche. Whatever industry you're in, you want to look for an agency that has experience dealing with the types of customers that you deal with, the type of businesses that you are. And there are tons and tons and tons of options out there. There are many great branding agencies and they're all a little bit different. The strategies are all a little bit different, but at the end of the day, you want to choose one that is going to 
fit with your industry. And for the most part, a lot of these branding agencies are offering something very similar. Now there, there are vast differences into the specific strategies that they use, but I can honestly tell you that having some strategy, some direction is better than absolutely nothing at all. <laughs> you don't want to just go out there blind. Yeah. So we covered a lot today. I hope that something in here inspired you to discover and explore some new ideas that you may not have had before. But if you enjoyed this episode, please go ahead, give us a like and tune in for the next episode of Brand or Die. We'll see you then. Adios, muchacho. <laughs> <laughs>